America meant land. A vast continent stretching westward offered generations of growth and wealth to land-hungry European emigrants. The British government tried to keep the colonists concentrated along the coast, mostly to avoid costly Indian wars. But the settlers continued crossing the Alleghenies into areas like Kentucky. Kentucky was the hunting ground of the Cherokee, Iroquois, and Shawnee tribes. And they were greatly alarmed by the constant influx of hunters, farmers, and land speculators. Home for these Indians was to the north, in the Ohio Valley, which had once been a French colony and only recently come under British domination. The British worked through the French population to control the Indian tribes. When the American Revolution began, the British actively encouraged the tribes to attack the American frontier settlements. Henry Hamilton, Lieutenant Governor of Detroit and British commander in the West, hoped these Indian raids would divert American troops and supplies from the war in the East. One man in particular was responsible for organizing these scattered Kentucky settlers into more defensible groups. His name was George Rogers Clark, already a fourth generation American, born in Virginia. Clark was only 22 years old when the revolution broke out. Good to see you in Kentucky. Mighty good to see you, George. That's right, smart you finding us this far out, George. Sure glad you're not a Shawnee warrior. Oh, well, I admit I've been a little impatient to hear what news you fellas bring from up north. Now, tell me, Ben, did you see the British garrison? Now, George, this little trip kept me on my feet for over two months, and I'm tired. Why don't we sit down a spell and we can talk it over? All right, Ben. I have to say, you fellas look a, a trifle thirsty. Boy, thank you, George. Mm. Oh, that's good Kentucky water. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Be careful there, young man. Now, George, the British is working hard. Old hair buying Hamilton and those British gentlemen, they're passing out scalping knives and they're giving the engine powder. George. I saw a half dozen Shawnee come into Kaskaskia waving scalps, and the British fired a salute. I can't say I'm surprised, Sam. I've had other reports of the British buying scalps from the Indians, so that's about what I expected. What about the French, Ben? They can't have much love for the British. Well, the British been telling stories on us, George. They say we'll burn their houses and kill everybody dead. I don't believe the French take much stock in it. I think they just don't know what to expect. We're going to be able to take advantage of that situation. Did you write down the number of troops in each village? Oh, I got them all right up here, George. I didn't want to write them down for fear we might get took by an engine raiding party. And if the engine sees writing on paper, well, he'd take it straight off to the British. It's a good thought, Ben. That's why I sent the both of you along on this. You're both trustworthy and smart. You boys have done a good service for Kentucky. Who is it? Come in, sir. Patrick? Come in, my friend, come in. 
Patrick Henry, this is George Rogers Clark. Hope you're feeling better, sir. Yes, somewhat better, thank you. Uh, pull up a chair, both of you. I hear you've been doing excellent work looking after the health of those brave families on the frontier. Well, we're doing our best, Governor, but we can't be everywhere at once. We rarely do better than give chase after the damage is already done. Kentucky can't hold on much longer without relief, sir. The situation is critical. It's been too dangerous to farm or even go out to the fields this year, so the settlers face another lean winter. People can't live year-round in a stockade. Yes, a desperate situation. Oh, Tom, let's have three glasses of sherry. It's on the table over there. Uh, the sympathies of Virginia are with the Kentucky settlers, Mr. Clark. But the war in the East will decide the fate of Virginia. And our resources are being heavily taxed to that end. I appreciate your concern, Governor. But I think you underestimate the danger from the West. If Kentucky falls, then Hamilton's savages will be burning homes in Virginia next spring. I think George is right, Patrick. The British will push the Indians as hard as they can. It, it won't be any easier to defend Virginia from this kind of attack than it has been in Kentucky and New York. Well, I share your concerns, gentlemen. But Virginia simply doesn't have the men to field an army for the protection of Kentucky. That's why I'm here, sir. I have a plan. If I may show you. Please do so, Mr. Clark. We need, sir, to attack this problem at its roots. The British are supplying the Indians from garrisons at Detroit, Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and here at Vincent. Now, I propose taking a small force of Kentuckians and starting... How here. small? Uh, 500 men, sir, if I can find them. Mm, it won't be easy to raise that number of men. I'm prepared to make do with a few less men if need be. Well, go on. By taking boats down the Ohio River to here, and then going overland to Kaskaskia, I believe we can surprise the British before they can get help from Detroit or gather support from their allies, the Indians. Now, the French will give us their support once we're there. Their influence with the Indians will be valued. Mm. What do you think of this plan, Tom? I think Mr. Clark is an exceptional man, and at the very least can give the British pause for thought. I believe we should support his enterprise. Well, I think Tom and I can convince the General Assembly to support this project, Mr. Clark. I only hope you can find enough brave souls. Any but the bravest have long since left Kentucky, Governor. I appreciate your trust, gentlemen. God willing, I'll send you Hamilton in chains. You are to proceed with all convenient speed to raise seven companies of soldiers, to consist of 50 men, each officer in the normal manner, and armed most properly for the enterprise. And with this force, attack the British post at Kaskaskia. Colonel Clark commands a much smaller force than he had hoped, about 175 men. But these men were veteran woodsmen and Indian fighters. They were used to long days of walking and could live off the land for months at a time. Armed with the accurate Kentucky long rifles, they fear nothing in the wilderness. After 10 days of hard travel, they arrive at Kaskaskia on July 4th, 1778. I immediately divided my little army into two divisions, ordered one to surround the town. With the other, I broke into the fort, secured the governor, Mr. Rocheblave, and in 15 minutes had every street secured. I then sent runners through the town, ordering the people on pain of death to keep close to their houses, which they observed, 
and before daylight had the whole town disarmed. And I want 30 horses saddled and ready for Captain Helm in five hours. Yes, sir, Colonel Make sure they're all strong and well fed. Yes, sir. Captain Helm, I expect you to have control of Vincennes within a fortnight. You can count on us, sir. My name is Father Pierre Givaud. The citizens have asked me to approach you. They hope you might allow them, for the sake of the children, to visit my church one last time, so that they might appeal to our father for protection in this crisis. I can assure you, Father, that I have no intention of interfering in the religious practices of the citizens of Kaskaskia. We are here to end these Indian raids against our defenseless women and children in Kentucky. We're looking for the British. You French deserve our anger only to the extent that you support this ugly practice of buying American scalps. You may use your church as you wish, Father Jabot. Thank you. May God bless you, Colonel Clark. May God bless you. Come, come. Soldier. See to it that their houses are left undisturbed during this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, what is it, Captain Renault? A man just arrived from the garrison at Kaskaskia, sir. Has this Commander Rocheblav reported any sightings of rebel forces? I'm afraid Commander Rocheblav has been taken prisoner, sir. An American colonel named George Rogers Clark has taken Kaskaskia and Cahokia. And I would expect by now, sir, he also controls Vincennes. George Rogers Clark? I've never heard of him. Who is he? How large is his force? A Virginian, I believe, sir. He has perhaps 300 men. Oh. Let Monsieur de Celeron leave immediately to carry war belts to the Wabash Indians. I want a company of the King's 8th Regiment of Foot and the militia ready to leave by the beginning of October. We'll collect our Indian allies along the way. Uh, Clark's been holding councils with the Indians, sir. And the French have been using their influence in his behalf. Those ungrateful French! Does an oath of allegiance mean nothing? So what's happened to the French militia? I left guard in those posts. Now, it doesn't matter. I'll have at least 500 Indians with me when I take back this son in the fall. And then comes spring. We'll go looking for this American colonel and his farmers. Hamilton's force leaves Detroit early in October and makes the difficult 600-mile trip down the Maumee and Wabash rivers to arrive in Vincennes on December 17th. Hamilton finds only a token force of three Virginians who immediately surrendered the fort. No reason that we have to worry about any kind of attack in this season from up here. Put that out of our mind. Ah, have the scouts returned yet? Yes, sir. They have nothing to report. Didn't see anyone. No British, no Indians, nobody. Good, good. Have a seat, Captain. Our good friend Colonel Vigo has informed us that Hamilton has retaken Fort Sackville and Vincennes. Captain Helm is now his prisoner. There seems to be no doubt that come springtime, he'll march against us with a force of, uh, well, counting militia and Indians. 500 men. 500? It's going to be mighty difficult to defend this fort against a force of 500 men. If we went down the Mississippi, we could be in Kentucky by the time that hair buyer gets here. We can't defend Kaskaskia against 500 men, you're right. But I didn't come this far to get chased off at the first smell of a chance to fight the British. I want Hamilton in chains in Virginia. Well, tell us what you got on your mind, George. Hamilton sent off his Indians for the winter. Right now, he's sitting at Vincennes with a force of less than 80 British regulars and militia. Now, using a route overland along here, I say we treat those British to an early spring. It looks to me like it's better than 200 miles, George. And with the waters this high, I'm not sure I'd describe it as being overland. <laughs> uh, it's closer to 250 miles. It will be wet and cold. But it's a chance. It's our only chance to stop Hamilton before the Indians head back toward Kentucky this spring. Right now, Hamilton is sitting in Vincennes, dreaming about springtime. 
thinking that nobody can cross these flooded plains to get to him. Maybe Hamilton's right. Can we do it, George? If I had ordinary troops, I'd be looking for the fastest route back to Kentucky myself. But I have yet to see the river or the mountain that can stop these men. You can count on me to come along, George. I'm uh, mighty anxious to speak to Governor Hamilton myself. My men are ready. I'm with you, George. All right, I imagine there's a few more of you. George, I'm with you. Back here. Better than going yeah, back. Back. On a rainy day in February of 1779, Clark leaves Kaskaskia with 170 men. Clark constantly concerns himself with the morale of his men. He leads them in songs and has each company give a feast for the rest each night. He acts as if taking Hamilton and Vincennes was a foregone conclusion. The spirit infects his men. Men feel encouraged this evening. They think themselves superior to other men and that neither the rivers nor the seasons could stop their progress. Their whole conversation now was concerning what they would do when they got about the enemy. They wound themselves up to such a pitch that they soon took Fort Sackville, divided the spoils, and before bedtime were far advanced on their route to Detroit. February 23rd, set off to cross the plain called Horseshoe Plain, about four miles long, all covered with water breast high. Here we expected some of our brave men must certainly perish, having froze in the night and so long fasting. Having no other resource but wading this plain, or rather lake of waters, we plunged into it with courage, Colonel Clark being first. Never were men so animated with the thought of avenging the wrongs done to their settlements as this small army was. About one o'clock we came in sight of the town. We halted on a small hill of dry land called Warren's Island where we took a prisoner. A duck hunter who informed us that no person suspected our coming at that season of the year. Finding the French citizens of Vincennes still sympathetic, Clark and his men moved quickly to surround the fort. A number of British soldiers are shot before the alarm is sounded. You there, soldier. Sir? What's that firing? It's the rebel troops, sir. Rebels? That's impossible. How many men did you see? From the number of flags, from their rate of fire. I'd estimate 500 men at least, sir. Perhaps more. To your post, soldier. Sir. Have we lost anyone yet? 
Only one man wounded on the left, Colonel. We just skinned him. I want everyone to stay low. There's no sense in taking any chances yet. Have the men started working on the tunnel yet? I got 15 men working on it down on the river. The way I figured, it'd take us two weeks of hard work to reach that fort if we set our minds to it. As long as they don't open them gates, I don't know how we're going to get in there for them. If they keep trying to fire that cannon, we'll be finished with them soon enough. We got five rifles waiting on that cannon. It won't take them long to learn that lesson. But have your men keep up the heavy firing. Hamilton can't be sure how many of us there are, and that's going to worry him. You leave a few men working at the tunnel where the English can see them. Have the rest of them get some food and sleep. Go. Yes, sir. Ah. Colonel Clark's compliments to Mr. Hamilton and begs leave to inform him that Colonel Clark will not agree to any other terms than that of Mr. Hamilton's surrendering himself and garrison, prisoners at discretion. On February 25th, Governor Hamilton surrendered Fort Sackville. He was sent to Virginia and spent two years there as a prisoner. Eventually, he was exchanged for American prisoners and spent the rest of his life as the governor of the islands of Bermuda and Antigua. George Rogers Clark was later falsely accused of spying for the Spanish. He was personally held responsible for many of the expenditures of the Kaskaskia campaign and spent the rest of his life in near poverty. When he was 60 years old, the Virginia legislature voted him a sword and half pay, $400 a year. He died six years later. Clark's conquest of the old Northwest caused the British to cede the Ohio Valley and the Great Lakes area in the peace treaty of 1783. Beginning in 1803, this territory became the five states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. It was the beginning of a westward expansion that would not end until we reached the Pacific Ocean.